I'm so excited about this one! Hey family, for those of you who don't know, my name is JD, and I was a career criminal and a drug addict for over 20 years. I've been to prison, and I was even in a gang. And the man that I am about to interview in this video, he did 23 years working as a law enforcement officer. He was a beat cop, he worked in domestic violence, and he worked in internet crimes against children. And as far as I'm concerned, this gentleman, he is one of my personal heroes. He did more to be able to keep his community and the children in his community safe than anyone else that I know. And this man has a massive platform over on TikTok. 2.3 million followers because the content that he makes today is all safety tips for women and for parents to be able to protect their children. You are in danger and you need to take some precautions. If you're 21 and can carry concealed, get your permit. At minimum, carry pepper spray. He is still out here fighting that good fight, even though he's retired from being a cop. Come here, come here, come here. Did I mention that he's also got a YouTube? And if you want to go give him a sub, I'll see you over there, because I've been subbed to Mike for a while. But hey, I think it's only fair that I warn you guys, some of what we're about to talk about is going to be pretty heavy. But I think that it's incredibly important information for all of us to have. He's going to give us some insights on what makes chomos tick and how they go about victimizing children. Y'all know what time it is. Let's go! The number of homeless people continues to rise in America. The housing costs continue to skyrocket, forcing people to find alternative, affordable options for housing. That's where containing luxury comes in, not just in offering affordable housing options, but also in offering unique investment opportunities where you can be a part of a business that is on the rise while also giving back to our communities. And just like containing luxury has made affordable housing available for everybody, they've also made investing available for everybody by starting their investments as low as $100. There's a link in the description if you want to invest in containing luxury. We've been talking about doing this crossover for a while now. For those of you who don't know, this is Mike from Killer Bee Tactical. And Mike has a huge platform over on TikTok. He's amassed 2.3 million followers because his content is really poignant and helpful for tips for people to be safe, particularly safety tips for mothers uh, and women and how they can stay safe because of his background. He was a cop for 23 years and he worked in a pretty specialty field. Mike, do you want to elaborate on that with this? Yeah, I um, I worked in crimes against children for seven years um, and I did mostly internet crime. Um, so I went out and hunted child predators. Okay. And so let us know, you know, for the folks at home who don't understand what that actually entails, like what would building a case against a child predator, how would that start and how would you build that case and gather evidence? They'd come in several ways. We'd get uh, online tips. A lot of times it was like, my child disappeared in the middle of the night, help me. And, and that's that's where I started. Um, so, you know, I'd start going through their their online history, who they're talking to, that kind of thing. And usually the parents have no clue that, you know, their, their child was talking to somebody and they just disappear in the middle of the night. Um, we'd also get tips through um, an organization called the National Center for Missing and uh, Exploited Children, NICMIC. Um, they work with the FBI and if a case, I don't want to say it wasn't big enough, but if a case uh, comes down and it's in my area or in my state, um, they would give it to uh, an ICAC guy, which is ICAC is internet crimes against children detective. Um, and we would start the case from there. They would do some footwork on it to, to show that, you know, this is, this is going on. Um, and then we would, we would just begin the case from there. We would do online stings. Um, I spent years posing as a 13 year old girl or 12 year old boy um and had all that all that set up and sent all those guys um just the conversation alone um because it's over the internet and it's out of state and you're using equipment that was not made in your state it's federal so all those guys would get 13 years minimum um and there is no early release for federal it's they, they when they go they go um so it was it Tough job. Um, saw a lot of really bad things. Um, and so the cases were always very difficult, but very rewarding as far as, you know, you're not getting any more innocent than a child. So, yeah, that's what I did. So, like, for a while, I was working with a sect of Anonymous, you know, Anonymous, the hackers. Yes. Um, we were setting up people and exposing them in their communities. Um, and I know that I posed for a while as a decoy. Um, and the things that I had come into my inbox, damaged my mental health so badly. It was so gut-wrenching. 
and it sort of, I believe to this day, I think that it changed the way that I saw the world in such a profoundly negative way. Did you ever have any experiences with that where these types of things affected your mental health profoundly? Uh, all the time. And you just, you learn how to handle it, go to the gym, you know, talking to us. They, I think they require uh, checking in with like a therapist now, um, mm -hmm. like once a month, but they didn't when I was doing it. I had to do that on my own. Um, but uh, yeah, to, to give you an example, if, if somebody's never done that before, and, and I never saw the perspective of what a lot of women have to deal with just in general, not to mention an underage child. Um, but my windows would pop, the chat windows would pop up so um, much on my screen. I had to turn myself invisible um, and just concentrate on the ones that are the most aggressive. Um, and a lot of people don't have any idea that that's what kids deal with now. So you're saying that there were so many people biting on these, on these apps that you had to like focus on just the ones that were the most prominent. There were that many people. Yes. And that's, that happens within minutes of me going online. Um, now you, you go where, um, I guess where, where a lot of people are. Uh, like in, in, at the times, chat rooms and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, and, and you're always like, I have rules as, as a detective, as law enforcement. Um, so it was always very, very clear that I was a child, never came off of it, had a whole backstory. Um, you know, it, it Nick Mick actually will, um, help you with photos. Um, and now that they have AI, they probably can just generate a child's photo now. Um, and, but I had a voice changer, the whole nine yards. We had, um, young detectives that were straight out of the Academy. Um, and you talk about jumping into it when you go, I mean, working child crimes is hard. Um, and, uh, going from the Academy, not having any experience at all, straight into crimes against children, helping us, um, those, those, uh, those people had guts. Yeah, absolutely. That's gotta be like a crazy transition from just going from being freshly trained to, to that specific field, that, that's got to be insanely difficult. Yeah. Now, I know this is probably because you worked in that specific unit for seven years. So this is probably like a, a weird ask. Do you have any idea, um, like just a rough estimate about how many people you were involved with taking down during that period of time? Hundreds. Hundreds? Um, yeah. Um, I used to, um, when I would hook somebody, and, and get them sentenced, I would take their mugshot and put it on my wall. Um, so mugshots about like that. Um, and I would write on the bottom how many years they got. By the time I left, I had uh, the walls were covered. That is, you are a straight hunter, bro. That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, when you, when you start, the police profession and you, you want to go after bad guys, you don't get any worse than that. In, in my opinion, um, somebody that, so I was really able to hone my, um, interrogation skills in that, in that specific area. I started in domestic violence. Well, I started on the street and then, you know, you, you get your, your legs under you and then you start, um, wanting to branch out. So I went to domestic violence and I was in domestic violence for, for five years. Um, but it wasn't like a who done it. You always knew who the bad guy was. So it was more about honing your um, your not really your investigative skills, but your um, your interrogation and your interview skills. Because um, you you a, a jury wants to hear a confession, um, especially in child crimes, because it's so bad that they can't wrap their 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 brain around a normal person can't wrap their brain around that a full grown man wants to have sex with a three year old child. Um, so they want to hear when they, when they got a big sentence over them, they want to hear the bad guy say it. Um, so there's pressure. Um, and in order to do that, uh, child predators, generally speaking, aren't wired like arm robbers. Um, they're introverted. So you can shut one down and they can ask for an attorney. And that's what you don't want. Um, when you bring a bad guy in, now, I would have my whole case video recorded, well, just like we're recording here. You could see everything from jump, what we talked about, what I did on screen, um, everything. And then you could play the whole thing for the jury. Um, so what basically my goal was, 
was to get him talking. Um, and, you know, there's different techniques that you would use um, to, to get that confession out. Um, but it, it's not like it's not like any other discipline. So we've all seen the movies where cops do the good cop, bad cop interrogations. Is that something that's an actual thing? Or... Absolutely, yeah. Um, now, I had a partner uh, that was a female detective, and she was a killer. I, and and it's, in, interrogation is, is like a, it's a science and an art. Um, some people just don't like you. Uh, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get the guy to talk. And we'd sit there and we'd talk about everything. Um, but then my partner would come in because she'd be watching in another room. You usually have like three or four detectives just so, you know, in case something goes sideways. Um, but they're also, they're looking at your suspect. They're looking at you, body language. They're seeing things and hearing things because they're not in it um, that I might miss. So I, I wouldn't get a guy to, 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 uh, to uh, confess, but then she would come in and she could honey baby them. They're there. It's, it's, you know, it's not your fault, that kind of thing. And um, she did, she would just kill them because that was her technique. And then it usually worked. So I'm assuming that you played a pretty good bad cop, man. Usually I didn't go down that road. I was usually very friendly um, mm -hmm. because everybody knows like, I think it's like caveman stuff. I think it's DNA that being attracted to a child is wrong. Um, like they will, villages will kill you over that. And I think that's, that's deep down. Um, now I did talk to, uh, psychiatrists and psychologists because I wanted to interview these guys even better. Um, and they said, basically go into it like this. If you're straight, I can't talk you into being gay. It's just how you're wired. That's how these guys are wired. And that's how you have to talk to them. Um, like I understand, you know, you have a, you have a sickness or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just a, it's just a, it's a weird interview technique. And then when you're out of that environment and you're sitting in front of a jury and you're watching yourself on video, cause we were, you know, video record all the, all the interrogations. Um, and you're sitting there going, you know, you're agreeing with this guy and you're just like, oh man, I can't believe I said that. And these people, it's an act, <laughs> you know? Yeah, but you got him to say what you needed him to say. Oh, yeah. You, well, you, you know, you blame the child, uh, which is awful, but it works in an interview technique. Let me ask you this, because you've said a couple of different times, a couple of different ways that it's like hardwiring and that it's something that's, you know, pre-programmed into the person. Do you think that there's any way to offer treatment to people who are child predators? <sighs> Man, I'm probably not the one to ask on that one. Uh, my my opinion is that um, they're like alcoholics; they can abstain, but the the chances of them relapsing is there. Um, so, do I think that you can fix them? No. Yeah, no, you're the right one to ask this question because <laughs> I 100% agree with you, brother. I uh, I have some pretty extreme beliefs on what treatment could be. Um, you know, wood chippers are a thing for me. I think Florida's got it down pat. I think more states should adopt that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's talk about this because this is really interesting because I've had a lot of people theorize that if they're facing the death penalty, that that means they have nothing to lose when doing this and they're more likely to kill the child. Do you think there's any truth to that? I think that that is always there. Um, I don't know if the death penalty is even a deterrence for this kind of criminal. Um, I don't think they can stop. I, I no. think that it's a compulsory thing and that it's kind of beyond their control, which in, in a lot of situations would garner some sort of sympathy for me. But when it comes to ruining child children and their innocence, I, I have no quarter. Yeah. I'm saying there, uh, you know, um, I went in to catch bad guys and, and we call it bad guys. Yeah. And, and thank you for your service in doing that, my friend. <laughs> so you worked the beat like on the street and you mm -hmm. worked in domestic violence and you worked in trial, child crime. So I'm sure you've seen some pretty horrific shit, man. Oh yeah. Um, is there any, are there incidents that stuck with you uh, that, that were so bad that, you know, they kind of just burn into your memory? Man, you'll have cases you can never forget. Once you see something, um, seeing it is bad. 
um, cause I've seen all kinds of CSAM videos. Um, hearing it is worse. Uh, you, you don't realize how much you will pick up, uh, through your ears that you can't forget. Um, and I still have, you know, triggers like, man, there was a time, um, when my, my kids were really little that they'd be watching, you know, children's shows and I'd break down crying. Um, and it was just, you know, PTSD, that kind of stuff. And you, you, when you're in it, you don't really realize you need to reach out. You know, you're, you're, you're at a, uh, your bucket is full. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, I always tell people like people that don't know will ask like, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? And I'm like, brother, my top 10 will give you nightmares. Yeah. And it's, it's funny to me, uh, it, it makes sense that you pointed out that the, the audio, you know, actually hearing something makes it another level of immersive terror, because I like myself, part of my background is that, you know, I, I was molested as a child. And, you know, it's not even the, the things that I saw when this was happening to me, that bring back those memories, um, and give me panic attacks from it as much as sounds sometimes smells yeah. um you know it, it's it's a the other senses can be just as triggering as what you see and i don't think a lot of people understand that um when you were out working the street um were you in a, a pretty dangerous area or were you in a pretty safe area no um man i i get bored easily so um i went to places where we worked a shooting a day um, there's a shooting or stabbing every day. And if, it, if the person died, it makes the news. If they don't, it's just another day. Um, so I, I like being in busy areas. I like, you know, making runs and, and uh, catching calls. You ever been shot at? Six times. Six times. <laughs> and, Bro, I, I, you ever, anybody ever got you? No, no. Um, but I learned uh, the, the snap and the hiss, what, what all that means. And, um, you know, it, it's not cool like in the movies and when it first happens you're like did somebody just shoot at me uh <laughs> that shouldn't be your first reaction it should be to get down and get low and get moving um but uh but yeah um getting shot at in the city sucks because because of all the echo you can't tell where the shots are coming from while you were out there dealing with all of this on the streets uh what did you ever have any really high profile cases um, being a, a beat cop, you know, you, you're, you're the first responder, you make it and the, the homicide guys come in, you know, or, or yeah. some, or some detective comes in and it's their, it's their case. You know, I'm just guarding the scene really. When you, you transition to domestic violence, um, I know that a lot of your content is about women protecting themselves. Right. Did you see some things while you were working in domestic violence that gave you a passion for that as well? Like any kind of specialty has, it has a shelf life. Um, and Burnout for crimes against children is two years. And I'm not sure what DV is, but um, you get less empathetic. And then when you, when you get less empathetic, it's time to get out and move on, do something else. Because it, it does take a passion when you're working with domestic violence victims because they care for that person and the person is the bad guy. Um, so it's, and you have to prepare your case like, it's not a matter of if your victim's going to turn on you, it's when. Um, so you have to get things that if they leave or they refuse to come to court, things that are still admissible in court, like the 911 call or some kind of spontaneous utterance, um, because otherwise you're going to lose your case. So in your experience uh, in working in domestic violence, does that, are there a lot of cases where it's just a one-off or is this generally a thing that, that ends up being more progressively violent? No, man. Um, what's what's odd and what I would tell people is that everybody kind of knows that an abuser will always abuse unless they get some kind of help. Um, they will move on to find somebody they can beat on. Um, but what people don't know is a lot of DV, DV victims, if they don't get some kind of help, they will go on to find somebody that will beat them um, because they look for those same traits. So it's not only the abuser that, that you know, is stuck in this cycle, but the victim is as well. Um and like I said, that's, you know, it's, that's frustrating. It's a frustrating part of the job. Do you think that in some way it kind of is a, a, a relative of Stockholm syndrome? Man, I don't know. Um, I know that there's probably some conditioning. Um, 
and some, you know, some things that they just need therapy, uh, yeah. basically. And then they may not know that it's going on. Like domestic violence is a cycle. Um, and you can pretty much, the, the phases are, are pretty, you know, pretty distinct. Um, and just about anybody that's in that situation, they're usually going through that cycle. I know that a lot of people um, are weirded out by the fact that I used to be a career criminal and that I've always stated, even when I was a criminal, like I didn't view the cops as an enemy. Like there was, it was, you know, it was a game that we were playing. Mm -hmm. I had a job to do and, and they had a job to do. They were doing the right thing. I was doing the wrong thing. It was my job not to get caught. Right. But I never blamed right. it like on the cops. So I've never been an ACAB type of person. Um, but like you have always been the type of person who has struck me throughout the time that I've known you that has compassion and understanding that people can change. Um, have, yeah. Did you see that throughout your time working in law enforcement? Um, man, I always loved when people could turn it around. Um, I, uh, when there are success stories, because, you know, I always see people on their worst day. Um, and, and, I, and I keep that in mind. Um, and I don't get a lot of follow up unless, you know, I'm the detective on the case or whatever. But I usually, you know, once the case is over, I don't see them like 10 years later. Um, but I did have one case that uh, it was a success story. And it's kind of dark, <laughs> but um, it was a domestic violence case. And um, this guy was a truck driver. And he brought up uh, a Cuban lady from down in Florida up here in the middle of winter. And all she had was warm weather, like shorts and a tank top. That's all she had. Um, so he ends up, he's married. Um, and she is the girlfriend on the side and she ends up getting pregnant. Um, and he beats her to the point and strangles her to the point where she loses the kid. So, um, there was a, that was a, a, a forensic case because, um, he had strangled her. And what a lot of people don't know is you can use an infrared camera and you can see the hand on the neck. It's under the, under the skin from the busted blood vessels. Um, but, um, Anyway, at any rate, um, to say she was alone and abandoned and had, had like just stranded is an understatement. So, um, man, I loved all my um, my uh, victims advocates because they, like I'm that one hand and they're that other hand because um, I don't know how to do all that stuff. I know how to like send somebody to prison and, you know, investigate the crime and all that. They know how to help somebody you know, and, and, and get them support. And, you know, these are the places you need to go and this is where you can get money and this is how you can find a job, that kind of thing. So they hooked her up. And, um, before the, the, that case was over, she had gotten a, a job at a meatpacking place and was making more than me. Wow. So it was, I mean, it was a, it was a great outcome. It sent the guy to prison, uh, and all that, but, um, but yeah, she's, you know, got up, got up, got over all that and is thriving. That's so, amazing. Yeah. So that's one of my, one of my better stories. And I know that's not a great story. <laughs> well, I mean, it's got a very dark root, but you know, yeah. it, it turned out well. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, a lot of the redemption stories, man, they, they start out with some really hard shit, bro. You know? Yeah. Um, so I was actually, I did an interview with the sheriff from Lone Oak County in Arkansas, a really cool guy. Um, he actually has a program that he instituted in their County jail where um, people that are facing like 60, 40, 30, 20 years can do treatment instead of going to prison. And these are people, it's not like first time offenders. They have a drug court for that. These are people that have been through the system over and over and over again. And what he's trying to do is break that recidivism rate. And, and yeah. it's all people that it's all drug based stuff, you know, whether it's, you know, the crime itself was, you know, it could be anything, but if they have a substance use problem, he gets them in there. And so he let me come in and tour the jail and I interviewed him. And unfortunately I, I'm still missing part of the, the video footage to be able to release the interview. But um, he and I talked at length. He said that one thing that law enforcement really needs is better peer to peer services. Like I know that those of us in recovery, you know, we employ peer to peer services. You know, I'm a, a, a peer recovery support specialist that's part of what I do when I'm working with people who are trying to get clean. And he said that, you know, somebody who hasn't lived in law enforcement and seen the dark stuff and 
all of the stuff that you guys go through is not going to be able to understand or offer the same type of support. Is that something that you think is a valid thing? I had a, um, a psychologist that was military. Um, he was a psychologist in the military as well. So he dealt with a lot of guys that had PTSD and all that, but they had my kind of PTSD, um, which, you know, I don't know. It's not my area, but it was easy to talk to him because he'd been there and done that. Um, law enforcement needs to be intentional in peer support, like especially on shootings and things like that. Um, Cause it, it's almost, it, it can run the gambit of being, you know, something that really weighs on you to something that some people have no problem. Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely something that law enforcement needs. Yeah. And I, I feel like a lot of people get mad at me when I talk about that on the internet. They're like, bro, these cops are out here killing people and all. A lot of this stuff could be avoided if we had proper support for people who were going through, like I've been through a certain amount of traumatic incidents, you know, I've, the childhood thing and, you know, the stuff that I went through on the streets and the stuff that I went through in prison and then back on the streets, I put myself through a lot more traumatic stuff. The vast majority of that was self-inflicted. I put myself in terrible situations. Police are in traumatic situations. It seems like all the time, you know what I'm saying? Like, and even if it's not like overtly traumatic to them, just the idea of, knowing that you're putting yourself out in a situation where it, it could be live or die at any moment. You never know if somebody's going to attack you just because of the badge. Um, so it seems like you guys have such a, a strong need for better services and support going through that type of stuff does something to somebody. Um, and I don't think a lot of people really that haven't been through real shit understand the, the level of that. You said the burnout, on uh the you know the child crimes things is two years like two years and, and you can't do anymore i don't think people understand what burnout means that means you're literally incapable of continuing with that because it's dragging you to the bottom yeah um and you know just like with any other kind of trauma cops handle you know stuff the wrong way uh you know alcohol and things like that um so you definitely have to prepare people for what they're going to see. Um, I think police work is like no other job um, because you can go literally from a family that I like, I want to give you an example. Um, dad is um, sleeping with the infant in bed, rolls over on the infant and suffocates it. I go from that run to stolen bike run within like a couple hours. Um, and you know, those runs affect you. So when, when you show up to that report run and you're not very friendly, it could be because you just came from something horrific um, with no time to process. No, no. They want you on the, they want you clear and they want you on the next run. Yeah. And it seems like they're having a lot of staffing issues in a lot of areas across the country. I know like Florida has some, some pretty gnarly cops out in Florida um, and, you know, they were having such shortages of staffing that DeSantis had to offer incentives to bring in police from other areas Yeah, uh, to, to be able to get things going out there. And, and Florida is, you know, I haven't been to every single state, but out of the states that I've seen, Florida needs law enforcement. <laughs> they got a lot going on out there, brother. <laughs> I, my intention from moving from Oregon to Florida, you know, I was I was on the run. I was facing charges. They wanted 10 years from me here in Oregon. And I was like, I, I'm not doing it, bro. It's it's a connecting state extradition radius. I'm going somewhere else. And and Florida, I knew had a lot of treatment services. So my idea was to go out to Florida to get clean. And I got there and everybody was, I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to get clean. And they're like, you came to the wrong place, Bubba. <laughs> this was your stupidest idea on your worst day. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, man. I think everybody's having problems hiring. Um, me personally, I would suggest if, if somebody was like, I get asked a lot, what do I need to do, you know, to, to do what you did? Um, and my advice is to go federal. Um, if you can move, if you're not tied down with the family or anything like that, because the, the thing about the federal system is that you're going to have to move. Um, but, um, I think it's just, it's, they're, I don't want to say they're treated better. It's just a different type of career. Um, and like if, 
a friend of mine, if his kid wanted to get in law enforcement, I would tell him, you know, federal's the way to go. Moving on a little bit to what you're doing now, you make great content with tips for safety from criminals and everything. And you also have like, I've noticed that you have like a whole array of products that you recommend for people. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, yeah, man, always uh, pepper spray. I mean, if you've ever been sprayed with pepper spray, it, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it is awful. Um, it is. I've, I've been sprayed in training. I've been straight on, sprayed on the street um, by other policemen because they're trying to get, you know, the guy we're arresting and they get me. Um, but, uh, you know, I always, I always say if you're in a fair fight, your tactics suck. Uh, you know, on, on the street. Um, so cheat, especially if you're not as big and strong as your opponent. Um, and uh, a lot of people are like, well, I just carry a gun. And I'm like, well, there is a big space between a mean word and using a firearm. So pepper spray kind of helps, you know, in that space. And also if you can explain to a jury, um, cause if you end up having to shoot somebody, you know, uh, you can explain to a jury, look, I tried to de-escalate. I tried, you know, something lower on the force continuum being pepper spray and he just kept coming and I'd have a choice. Um, but yeah, uh, pepper spray, man, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, you get through TSA that, uh, like a doorstop alarm. Um, I always recommend because of hacking is so, um, I just did a video on something that it hacks, uh, hotel doors, like the, the key flipper, cards, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that thing is frightening. Um, yeah, I, I, there's a lot of things that I could do, have used that for if it was out when I was doing fraud, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, locks and things like that are deterrents. Um, you know, nothing's, nothing's foolproof. So if I can bring something with me when I go traveling, because I don't know how secure I am. Um, a travel, I always recommend a travel router. Um, and, and all these things can go on your carry-on. Um, they're TSA friendly, but a, a travel router and then like a, a little mini camera that has a motion sensor on it so that, you know, when you're not in your hotel room, you can still see who's in your hotel room, um, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. And those are great tips. And the travel router, like you, people don't understand when they're connecting their devices that have things like their banking information, you know, all of their addresses, uh, you know, everything about them. Like we keep everything about who we are in these things these days. And we are connecting to something that's not safe. That's pretty crazy. Uh, you know, I know that back in the day when I was doing bad things, you could send a link to somebody. And if you could get them to click that link, I could get access to everything. I could turn on your microphone or your camera without your phone screen being on and you wouldn't know. Uh, that's literally how severe it is. We actually did it to a detective that we found out was investigating us. Wow. Um, and it ended up being very boring and not at all conducive to us doing our own investigation. <laughs> um, and then he ended up being a really great guy. And, uh, you know, after he told me he was going to bury me under the jail because I wasn't giving him any information, we ended up being friends. We went to the same church. He came off the stage playing guitar on the church and, and gave me a big hug and told me he was proud of me. We worked out at the same gym. That's super awesome. cool. Super cool guy, man. Um, and, you know, I was clearly I was in the wrong. Um, but he, he'd investigated me for about a year. I investigated him for a couple months, <laughs> but it's scary how much access you can get to somebody's life. Like I always tell people, don't click links. If, if somebody sends you a link, do not click it. I've got one in my phone. Somebody sent me a text saying that I had a package that couldn't be delivered and click on this link. I know exactly what that is, Yeah, you know? So giving people those little types of tips on how to protect themselves is so important, especially from someone like you, who, who's got the background and the information and the experience with it. Well, all my stuff is old because I'm not, I tell people all the time, I'm not in the game anymore. So I don't know like what's happening right now, but this is as bad as it was when I was working. Um, you know, as far as, you know, kids disappearing in the middle of the night because they met somebody online, that kind of thing. Um, I'm, and things just get worse. They don't get better. So, um, you know, I'm always telling people, if you have teenagers, get them a bark phone. That way you can have you know, some control and monitoring, you're not, you wouldn't drop, take them to a bar and drop them off. That's basically what you're doing when you expose the world to your child um, and give them the world full access to your child. Uh, so yeah, the, the bark phone's a, a, a pretty good idea, I think. So what, in, what 
actual controls parentally do you have with a bark phone and can you limit access to things like on different levels with your kids yeah it comes completely locked down um so an iphone um i apple is all about security and safety and, and for a adult that's great but for a kid and a parent that wants to monitor their child's phone apple won't allow it so bark went out and made their own phone it's an android but it comes totally locked down and then you give access the more maturity that your child shows and the more responsibility you want to give them. Um, but you can still see like if they send a message within an app, like on Snapchat, uh, you can see it. Or if they send a nude image or whatever, the, the phone will let you know, Hey, th this, this just happened. Um, mm -hmm. And they don't, I like it because it doesn't blow up your phone. I don't want to be all in my kids business but I want to know the big things. So if somebody has suicidal ideations or they have, um, you know, drug use or something like that, Bart catches it. They even have uh, the emojis so that if somebody sends like a, a the spaghetti mo emoji, that means nudes, noodles, um, which I didn't know that. I didn't um, know that either, bro. You just educated but, me on that. But they keep up with all that. All the, all the, you know, the, the slang and everything because they see it every day um so yeah that's um that's one of the disadvantages of not being like i said in the game and talking about you know all the uh the things because i don't know i have to rely on like google <laughs> or yeah. you know, or people coming to me and saying can you help me with this and i'm like yeah, I'm, i can help you a little bit or point you in the right direction um so speaking of which do you know which of the platforms are the most rife with uh predators uh yeah discord snapchat um a lot of drug dealing is done on snapchat um, yeah and with fentanyl being as bad as it is uh it man it scares me to death um yeah just one was um oh what was the name of that one it's all video and, and they finally shut it down but basically it was like a roulette wheel and you video chat with other people omegle that's it yeah. yeah, they uh, they shut that down here recently because it's so rife with child predators. Yeah, um, but yeah, I, I, so, don't, I don't think I don't think parents know just how how bad it is. I don't think so either. And Snapchat, like, I, I have a personal disdain for Snap Snapchat. Like the whole premise of why it was created in the first place to be able to send nudes that disappear. Like, if it's all consenting adults, I get that. Then they started adding all of these kid-friendly filters yep. to entice kids to be on there. And I was like, nah, bro. Uh, absolutely not. And, like, you know, as, as a married man, I have no business having a Snapchat. Right. As a kid, kids have no business being on Snapchat, in my personal opinion. And I might be, like, an, you know, I might be a boomer at this point. I, I might be overprotective. But, like, I would not allow my kids to have Snapchat. Not any of them, not for any reason. If you want that, have it when you're 18. If I find it on your phone, you don't have a phone anymore. Right. And it's the main uh, the main app of children today. Number one is Snapchat. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. And that, the, the worst part is that, um, well, like I said, I, I'm, I'm, Bart can monitor it, so at least there's that. But um, the, uh, the worst part is that they get the confidence. They think their image or whatever they said is deleted. It's not deleted. Snapchat holds all that on their servers. So when they send a nude, Snapchat stores it, and then Snapchat gets hacked, and that nude goes out to everyone. Um, and, and that's happened. That I know of, that's happened twice before. Um, wow. And when you start talking about, like, going to college or, you know, getting a security clearance if you wanted to work federally or whatever, um, you know, all that's out there now. They're storing CSIM. Yeah. Unknown, well, either knowingly or unknowingly. They're required to um, to report all that, like whenever they get it. And then um, what Nick Mc does is they make a, a, um, a hash number. They assign that image a hash number. So it is more um, exact and identifiable than a fingerprint. So like if I, if that number pops up, it, it is absolutely that image that is CSAM. Um, and the reason that's important is because when, like as a detective, 
um, say I catch a guy and we go and get his computer and his phone and all that. And we submit all that um, to the FBI crime lab and they can run a program instead of having me to look through every single photo that runs it against those numbers. So you can find all these known images um, and, you know, you'll, you'll say, well, he had 650 images that were CSAM. And that way I don't have to look at all that stuff. Yeah, that's great. That's great. The fewer people who have to be exposed to it, the better. Yeah. Um, that's well, awesome. TikTok had a, a recent thing not too long ago where I don't know if they got sued or people just quit, but they weren't telling them like all the awfulness that they would see that, you know, uh, as moderators that they would see the people send um, that doesn't get put out on TikTok, but they have to see it. Um, so there was some dust up here recently with them not too long ago. I remember something about that. What do you think, um, as far as like the new innovations of AI imagery, how do you think that that could affect, you know, people that are just innocently putting pictures of their kids online? They're not thinking that somebody's going to take that picture of them playing with their child and that they're going to use it to make explicit imagery with AI. Um, right. What do you think some of the implications of that could be? Oh, man. Um, our laws are so behind in, in tech. Um, and with AI, I mean, you're talking about huge changes just four months ago. That's how fast this is evolving. Um, they're all over the dark web now, uh, those, those created images. I don't think the laws are, um, are up to speed, especially in most states with the creation of AI, because they're like, well, it's not a real image, you know, um, it's not a real person. And uh, so are that you was, saying that they're not technically illegal to have explicit child images if it's made by AI? In some states, that might be true. I don't uh, like that. I've been, I've been out of the game. So e yeah. in my state, even a created image is still illegal if it's depicting Good. a child. Um, I can tell you the number one image when I was still doing it um, was the copper tone baby. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I'd see it all the time. That's crazy. And it, it, you know, back when copper tone first started using that image, it was a very, you know, an innocent type of thing seemingly, you know, yeah. and today it just feels like there's so much insidious stuff going on with, with child predators, you know, like the Nirvana, you, did you ever see the Nirvana nevermind album cover? Oh Yeah. So they used that, and now that that baby is grown up, and he's pissed off about it. Yeah, understandably, but right. none of us thought anything about it at the time. Yeah, it's yeah. just evolved, and things have gotten so crazy. And with tossing AI into the mix, you know, there could be a whole lot of kids that are growing up finding explicit material of them that may not be super easily distinguishable from being real or not. Four months ago, AI was having problems with hands it couldn't get the hands right mm -hmm. and in in four months time ai has solved that problem um so now that the images are very realistic uh, another thing is uh scammers um cloning voices uh, and i used a super cheap app to do it and did a message and called my folks and my folks thought it was me wow yeah um, and, and like I said, I wasn't even using like the expensive one. I was using the like one that a kid would use. I've, I've used those before to like mimic, uh, you know, President Biden's voice and stuff like that. And content. Sure, super yeah. cheesy, but oddly realistic uh, results. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, I think AI is going to be a problem. I mean, I'm sure it's going to fix a lot of stuff, but um, I think it's going to enhance and create new problems. Oh yeah, definitely. We're, we're not ready. I think that we've delved into the deep end of something that we're, our laws are not ready. Our, our safety procedures are not ready. And I just don't think the general public is ready in, in their information and knowledge of what's coming. Um, and I think that's why, you know, the, the uh, head guy at chat GPT was like, we need to pump the brakes on this a little bit. Yeah. And then they fired him and everybody yeah. was like, no, we're all quitting unless you bring him back. Like we're already seeing some of it from the people who are actually really hands on and know what's coming. And to give you an idea of how overloaded um, ICAC detectives are, 
So if I got an image and I didn't know who the person was, they weren't confirmed. Their, Nick Mick didn't have their name and their age and exactly where they live and all that. If I would get an image and this person um, had secondary sex characteristics, it got lower in the pile because there's so much infant stuff and, and toddler things. Um, that's what you're up against. Could you explain to me what is secondary sex characteristics? Like um, uh, breast development, hair growth, that type of thing. Okay. So they're mainly focusing on, on infant. Children. Like somebody that has is not a teenager yet. Uh, and there's that much of it out there. We were covered up. I mean, like, like I said, I, I had to go after, if, when you were that covered up, you have to prioritize which cases get your attention first. Um, and the ones that would, would be a maybe, they would be less of a priority than somebody that I knew was, in fact, a, a, a teenage, a, a younger than a teenager. And I don't think that people have any idea how prevalent this is. I think that people don't really want to wrap their minds around it. And I think that most people, like normally wired people, uh, you know, as troubled as we might be, I don't think that a lot of us even want to confront the fact that this is as big of a problem as it is. It's so awful. Well, even other detectives, they would not come in my office. <laughs> oh, wow. Because because of not just like, I mean, I'd see all the, the CSAM stuff and that was awful. But like, think of all the really messed up videos you've seen they would always be on these dudes computers it's always dudes um i may have had one female in my wow. whole career one one it's all dudes um so anyway but yeah um like there's i probably shouldn't even name them but there's videos called the pain olympics it's it's so bad yeah, I don't. I, I can already tell where the shit that is going, bro. Yeah. Uh, so look, let me let me ask you a question. If you're uncomfortable, uh, you know, speaking about this, but like, as far as demographics, from what I noticed, like, largely in prison and from the research that I've done, it seems to be a lot of white dudes, bro. It is. Yeah. Um, like it seemed like the majority of these child predators were were white dudes. Um, I, I'm guessing it's a, I, I don't know if it's just a numbers thing or, or, you know, it's a culture thing. I don't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the stereotypes living in the basement, the whole nine yards, there's a reason. Yeah. They're the yeah and, and like a lot of them look like they just crawled out of like Mordor from the Lord of the Rings. Uh, you know, just some twisted creatures, bro. A lot of them got to the honor housing and, and we never got to go to honor housing. It wasn't protective custody. It was like a, you, you didn't get in trouble for 18 months. So we're going to give you a better, safer place to live. Um, but they were still intermingled. You'd see them come out for showers and like, just bro, like, what is that? Right. Did you um, have to deal with a lot of those off-putting looking types of characters? Uh, yeah. I mean, all the, there's those guys. And then there's, I always say, nobody gets a pass. Mm -hmm. It's your police officer. It's your preacher. It's, you know, you're the person running the daycare. It's a lawyer. It's, nobody gets a pass. Um, but um, there were always the ones that would, that would surprise you. Um, and then the, the ones that, you know, you're like, oh, I could see that 10 miles away. Um, but yeah, as far as, as far as child uh, exploitation, nobody gets a pass. Facts. So as far as like, did you see that there was a lot of people in, uh, you know, occupations that allowed them access to children? Churches, they ask, schools. Yeah, they intentionally position themselves. If somebody's attracted to a child, they'll be a Boy Scout leader or they'll be in the church group, you know, with the youth group. Um, they intentionally position themselves in those, in those areas. Um, mm -hmm. And it, I mean, you just have to vet people, uh, you know, and, and child abusers are usually not the career criminal type. They don't have a rap sheet. Um, they're not out here doing robberies. They're a specific type of person. So if they have offended before, it may go unreported. Um, so you, you just, like I said, man, nobody gets a pass. 
Yeah. And, I can and tell you this. Is, and when I'm looking at like, I go to the gym and I got my little girl with me that's three. Um, or I go anywhere. And there's like a play area. If it's a dude, she doesn't go. Word. Word. I can't argue that at all whatsoever. You know what I'm saying? You do see the occasional... Uh, you see the occasional female perpetrator in the news, but mainly that's mostly like, you know, teachers and, and high school boys. When it comes to the youngsters, bro, it's dudes, man. Yeah. Yep. It's dudes. You know, when I was in prison, uh, it, it was weird because they get really protected by a lot of the COs. And uh, part of it, what a CO explained to me is that they don't see them as, as, threats or dangers they're like they're not real criminals like you guys they're more like a subhuman creature that poses no threat to us and so when to hear you say you know they're not normally career criminals or whatever that really struck a bell because you know that's how it's perceived on the inside in prison as well um the, the ceos are like that dude's not gonna stab me uh so you know he kind of gets a pass uh he's never confrontational and um you guys that are here on you know drug crimes you might not be a, a disgusting, evil creature, but you're a threat. So, yeah. Is there anything that you want to plug or anything that we can promote while, while we're doing this video? I have my own YouTube. It's very limited. Um, I do a lot of shorts um, and I did some longer content that was all serial killers um, and it's just audio. So okay. I, I, picked, I picked out some, some, I don't know, I don't want to say my favorite serial killers, more interesting serial killers. <laughs> yeah, but I only, I only did like 10 or 12 um, podcasts because it takes time. <laughs> did you ever do anything on the happy face killer? The guy that actually has that moniker, um, who is like a convicted serial killer. And then Keith there's Jefferson? like, yes. And then there's like, he the sucks, bro. And I, I, I punched him in the face three times at OSP. <laughs> He's a piece of shit, dog. I hate that dude. Talking about, inter I'm always fascinated with, you know, people and how they react and, um, sociopaths are always interesting um i got to sit in on one on, on a, he had killed like seven people um and uh they to hear him talk about what he did and how he did it stone cold no remorse like i'm talking to you about what i'm gonna buy at the grocery is it's chilling to to know to like have the pictures of what this guy did and then have him, yeah, yeah, I did all that. And, you know, it, it's just, you talk about a stone cold killer. Those, those guys are a different beast. In, in thinking about that, do you believe that there is like a legitimate evil? That there are people that are legitimately evil? Do you think that it's just, you know, miswiring in the brain? Or do you think that there's something spiritual, a spiritual factor that might take over people that makes them legitimately evil people? Man, I think um, as with most most things and, and being in police work and all that, it's never, it's the, the, the crime is never clear cut. There's always like other things that factor in. And I think with this, this as well, um, I think it's has something to do with, I think it's everything, spirituality, genetics, um, socialization, like what, what's happened in their life to, to make them this way. Um, some people are probably predisposed pre, uh, to be this way. But oh, like with the serial killer guys, almost all of them have a horrible childhood. Um, there's something that is just, you know, awful. Um, now, that doesn't happen. Every, I mean, everybody has a, you know, uh, there's a lot of people that have had bad childhoods that are not serial killers. Um, but maybe they were predisposed to this and that just flipped that switch. I know that there is a definite parallel with people who had severe trauma in their childhood to being predisposed to things like addiction. Um, you know, and that's addiction of any, you know, any compulsory uh, obsessive thing, you know, whether that be, you know, an eating disorder, gambling addiction, substances, sexual disorders like that. Um, and then there's also, you know, I was listening to an interview and uh, so being from Eugene, Oregon, which is right next to Thurston, Oregon, I don't know if you remember about the Thurston school shooting back in the day. <laughs> um, the kid who did that, his name was Kip Kinkle and he killed his parents took their pickup truck to school while he was in high school with all their guns and just unloaded on a bunch of people. And it was one of the first major school shootings in the U S um, and there was a scientist uh, who a neuroscientist who actually 
did brain scans of Kip Kinkle and said that it was the most underdeveloped and horrifying brain that he had ever seen. Um, so, you know, it, it leads me to believe that with some of these people that there's probably serious neurological issues going on. Um, and they probably had, you know, trauma that, that stunted some of their development or whatever, but at a point like it's, you know, it's, it's interesting to know and understand where these things came from, but it's not a risk that we can have, you know, that they're going to be out there hurting people, especially children. School shootings are especially terrifying um, because you're running as hard as you can to get to that run. Um, the training is tough because they, they sit you down and explain to you, look, you have to push to the, to the stimulus. You have to push to the threat because the longer you take that person's still in there killing people and you have to be mentally prepared. You're going to pass, pass kids that are hurt. Cause you're, you can't stop. You got to go to, you got to go to the threat. And the worst part is the shooter might be a kid. Um, yeah. and, and dealing with all that in that training, uh, is, is rough. Um, you know, it's just things you don't, you didn't think about before, um, before you had the training. Yeah. That's a, a really hard reality. And, and while we're talking about that, what do you think happened in, in Uvalde, bro? What do you think happened? Where was the, the chain that broke down to where those cops were just, was there a justifiable reason that they weren't pursuing the shooter? I'm speculating. I don't know. I'm assuming they were told to stand by. And as a police officer, you're not getting the full story. And if your chief tells you to stand by, um, did they think that an, another SWAT team was, was in taking care of business? Did they know? I mean, there's so much I don't know about that. Uh, there was definitely a breakdown. Um, but, man, we are just one of the troops, I guess. And um, and something like that's happening. You want to say that, you know, you would absolutely, you know, uh, go against whatever the orders you got and go in there and take care of business. But I'm guessing they didn't have all the facts. I just don't know, man. I, I definitely don't. I'm not trying to defend them. Um, but I'm trying to make sense of it. Well, yeah, and, and that was what I was hoping is that you could just give us some insights as to possibly what might have gone down. And it, it sounds like there's a lot of factors behind the scenes when it comes to these types of things. I just know, like, you know, seeing scenes of them stopping parents from going in to try to save their kids yeah. while law enforcement is idly armed, standing in wait, not doing anything, and parents getting kids and running them out. And, you know, there was just, that was a pretty horrific scene, man. I, I, I don't know where the failure was there, but uh, I just know as a, as a parent, as a private citizen, as somebody who's not law enforcement, it, it looks really bad. Cause I, I would put my life on the line for anybody's kids, man. Any yep. kid. Yep. And I, I know that you feel the same uh, you, yeah. you, you I mean, I mean, in your career for a yeah. long time. So it's just horrific. And I've tried to make sense of it ever since. And I haven't been able to wrap my brain around how we get to the point where there's someone actively shooting kids down a hallway and we're all standing waiting on orders. Yeah, I, I don't, man, I don't know where the breakdown was. Um, hopefully they, they eventually tell that whole story. Um, I'm sure it's being litigated. And the worst part in being in law enforcement is you can't talk about it. If it's, if it's getting litigated, you're not allowed. They will fire you in a heartbeat and could charge you with a crime for, you know, tainting a jury. So what what's tough is that, like, man, I've been on, um, you know, homicide scenes or, or whatever, and I know the story. I was there. And then you read in the paper the next day, and it's a completely different story with a, with a weird spin. And I'm like, that's not what happened. But I can't say anything. And I just have to let it ride. Like, whatever the, whatever the news wants to say, they can say. Um, so that's a, a very frustrating part about law enforcement that not a lot of people, a lot of people talk about. Um, because like I said, you know, you were there, you know, the story, you talk to the victims. Um, but it's, it's not, you're just not allowed to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Now, I think it sucks to be in that situation and having your hands tied as to being able to even, you know, clarify or defend yourself. That has to be so frustrating, bro. Well, and I, those are also um, rules and laws that are antiquated because now with the internet, I mean, it used to be you'd, you'd have to wait a couple of days for the paper to come out and all that, and that's how the news got got out. Now, 
somebody can tweet something and be all over the world. And that's the story. The first story is the one they're going to go with. And it's mm -hmm. about being first, not being right. Um, so that part's, that part's also frustrating. Um, I, I, I think just saw that the other day. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you saw the whole Toronto Joker situation unfold on uh, TikTok. But he was like a wanted fugitive in Canada. And he's completely face tattooed. And they're like, he's he's nationally federal warrant, you know, national warrant. And he's out taking TikToks in front of cop cars with all his face tattoos blinging. That's and uh, it, it was it was hilarious. But then somebody leaked a video of somebody getting arrested in the Toronto area and said it was Toronto's Joker. N within hours, the Toronto Sun is releasing a press story about him being arrested. And he's on Instagram hitting me up because I did an interview with them. And he's like, he's like, yeah, that's not me, eh? I'm like, yeah. That's great. So, uh, yeah, it's it's really wild how information will just leak out there in any way, shape, or form. And people just run with it. And it is the first thing that you hear that most people, they're not going to hear anything else. You never hear the retraction. Right. Yeah, and like I said, and a lot of that has to do with um, policies and procedures and law, and they, there needs to be some changes that they that, so they can address, you know, if, if the wrong information gets out there that the people that actually know can talk about it. Um, I don't know what that is. I'm not smart enough to, to you know, figure that one out. But um, as it is right now, you know, you can't talk about anything. Well, Mike, I really appreciate your time, man. Uh, I appreciate you sitting here and talking with our community um if anybody uh wants to find mike he is killer b tactical here on youtube killer b tactical on tiktok uh he makes amazing content if you are interested in keeping yourself and your family safe this dude has the tips and he pumps them out all the time and plus he's just an astoundingly good dude so we really appreciate you mike thank you brother i appreciate you